Welcome to the webinar for March 2019. And our topic this month is the new world of the Internet of Things, or IoT. I could have called this many different things, but what I want to do is just talk about the fundamentals of IoT. We really haven't talked specifically about IoT in past webinars, and we do have a very important new certification and certification path that will be starting in September of this year when the Certified Wireless Solutions Administrator exam is released. CWNP is the Certified Wireless Network Professionals organization. And we're not just about Wi-Fi. We've never been just about Wi-Fi, but our primary focus has always been Wi-Fi. Well, we're going to be branching out into the rest of the wireless world. And of course, with IoT, a big part of it is Wi-Fi, but there are other things involved as well. So consider this kind of the starting point into the world of IoT. We'll probably have more webinars throughout the year, and certainly our certification track in the general wireless world will cover IoT in greater depth than anything else that's available out there right now, as well as other wireless technologies. So I don't want to give the impression that the new track is going to be just about IoT, because it's certainly not, but it will be a significant portion of the learning throughout the process. As usual, we're on Twitter at CWNP, and I'm at Carpenter Tom. so if you want to follow us there, you can certainly do so. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about IoT in general. We'll get into some specifics of some protocols that are used and things like that. I'll share with you a bit of my opinions about the world of IoT, and of course, that's always interesting. <laughs> and we will uh, talk about where IoT is and where it's going over the next few years. So first of all, what is it really? What is this thing called IoT? It's interesting because the book, The Internet of Things, Architectures, Protocols, and Standards by Wiley, 2019, so a pretty new book, has a section title in it that really got my attention. It was titled, Designing the Architecture of an IP-Based Internet of Things. Okay, so this is a really interesting phrase. Designing the architecture of an IP-based, I want to focus on that, IP-based Internet of Things. Well, what else would it be if it's the Internet of Things? Think about it. The Internet is IP-based. In fact, just the other day, I was looking at a presentation by one of the founders of TCPIP, and he was talking about how that it gave birth to what eventually became what we call the internet today. Now, we use terms internet and internet work kind of loosely in the industry. So internet with a lower I can just mean a TCP IP based network. Internet with a capital I is meant to be the internet. And the interesting thing is that I've never seen internet of things without a capital I unless it was just a typo. And what I mean by that is even if it's in the middle of a sentence, today we're seeing an onslaught of Internet of Things devices. The I will be capitalized. So historically, when the I is capitalized, it means the Internet and not just Internet work technologies. So this has brought some frustration to me because I, I like clarity. I like things to be clear when they're communicated. So we have to ask the question, why is a section title like this needed? Well, it's needed because not all things use IP in the first place, and not all things actually connect to what we call the big I internet. So the internet of things is not really the internet of things in the way we think of the internet. The IP of things might be a better phrase, but then it's IP-based internet of things, right? Or just network of things. And I kind of like that because it's the acronym NOT. But I'm not going to change the world. I'm not going to get everybody to stop using Internet of Things as the term. But I want us to have clarity about what we're talking about. Most of these devices are now using IP instead of some kind of proprietary protocols for cyber physical communications. But it's not necessarily true. So the reality is that some of these do use very proprietary protocols and even need gateways, for example, in order for them to be able to get onto the Internet if they want to get onto the Internet or get onto the IP-based network that you might have in your organization. So the reality is that many assume that IoT devices must communicate on the Internet. 
But at least if we look at what vendors are selling as IoT devices, this is not so. There are many of them that actually never talk to what we think of as the internet. They only communicate within the organization's private network. That would make them maybe a pot, a private of things. <laughs> I don't know. But at any rate, um, the IoT is way beyond the internet. So the stuff that gets thrown into the IoT pot, maybe some of it shouldn't be there, but it is. And that stuff is really just the network of things. The way I would define IoT is probably different than most people. I would define IoT as bringing intelligence to previously unintelligent devices. And what I mean by that is, you know, think of a clock or a watch. You know, if we go back to the old watches, right, before digital watches that have computers in them, uh, we just go back to the old watches. They were analog. There were gears that were well-defined by master watchmakers so that they kept time based on pressure or whatever other mechanical element was in the watch. There was no intelligence there. There was just something that was built according to the laws of physics to allow it to keep relatively accurate time. And so the intelligence was fully in the maker and nothing in the device. Uh, think of the old coffee pots, you know, like my grandmother used to use the percolators, right? And so you put your coffee grounds in and put the water in. It was this physical thing. It had no chip in it. It had no intelligence whatsoever. It didn't even use electricity, right? You put it on the stove and heat does the work. Um, so unintelligent device, but now our coffee pots can be connected. They can use intelligence. Uh, for example, they can detect that you are on your way home from work and that since they've detected that you're on your way home from work based on the location of your phone, they can start brewing the coffee pot so that it's ready for you. Rather than having it semi-intelligent where it just has a schedule, right? It starts brewing the coffee at five o'clock. So when you get home, it's done. Rather, it's more intelligent. There's communications going on so that your phone is communicating back with your network, which is communicating with your coffee pot that you're on your way home based on trajectory of movement. And therefore, we're going to go ahead and start brewing that coffee. Now, I know you might be thinking, who wants a cup of coffee in the evening? Well, I do, but maybe there are other people as well. By the way, I don't use an IoT coffee pot. I use an Italian coffee maker that works on my stove with no intelligence in it whatsoever. Why? Because I like that coffee. The term IoT, Internet of Things, was coined by Kevin Austin in 1999. So that's where the term begins, but really the concepts can go back much, much further. Uh, we have things trying to talk to other things going far, far back, even into the 17 and 1800s. Um, obviously, intelligence associated with that communication has been evolving over time and mostly, obviously, since the digital revolution. So, you know, one of the things we think about is the industrial revolution in related to IoT. Um, the Industrial Revolution first started in the 1700s, the 18th century, and this was when we started leaving agrarian society and getting into manufacturing plants and things like this. And then the Industrial Revolution 2.0 started happening because of electricity, late 1800s, early 1900s, and we got automated assembly lines and things of this sort. And then Industrial Revolution 3.0 or Industry 3.0 really began with the computer age. So some say the 40s, 50s, 60s, right around that era when we started computerizing things. And now this thing we call IoT, a lot of people make it synonymous to Industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution. I don't know that it's exactly synonymous with it. I think it's a part of it because Industry 4.0 is about artificial intelligence, machine learning, things like that on top of the layer of the computer architectures and networks that we have built. So I think IoT is certainly a part of it. I think it will take advantage of it, but I think it's uh, somewhat periphery, but also just a component within industry 4.0. So uh, just a few thoughts for you to get started as we think about what is IoT really, okay? Now, let's talk about the nuts and bolts, the physical layer. So when we think about the physical layer of anything, we're talking about how do, how do bits get from point A to point B? How do they communicate? And what I want to illustrate for you here is not so much some exhaustive coverage of all things IoT, but I am covering right here 
the thing that drives better than 80% of IoT devices, depending on the resource you look at, it could be as low as 75%, it could be as high as 84 or 5%, but somewhere between 75 and 85% of all IoT devices use Zigbee, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or PLC. And so PLC is the one that gets left out a lot in the discussions you see out there because most people think of IoT as wireless IoT, but that's just not the case. There's nothing in IoT that in its fundamental definition says it must be wireless. And so there are other options too. First of all, we have Zigbee, uh, which is based on 802.15.4, uh, Wi-Fi, which is mostly still is 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Yes, there's 802.11ah, 802.11af. There are these other things that can work in lower frequency, but they're not used as heavily. You know, with all of the talk about Wi-Fi, Halo is built for IoT. It's going to be the thing for IoT. It hasn't been used as much, hardly at all, actually. So we'll have to see what happens in the future. Now, I have a theory behind that. I shared it with some folks last week. We did our CWS Roadshow. And I talked to them a little bit about why we probably haven't seen Wi-Fi Halo take off that much. A big part of it is the last decade, and we're getting close to the end of this one. Isn't that hard to imagine? I was just talking to someone the other day about how that, you know, I learned to use Photoshop and um, I don't use it as much now, but it can't have changed that much. I mean, it's only been, and then I stopped and realized it was 1999 when I first learned to use Photoshop, 20 years and so actually it has changed a lot. And I've used it throughout those years, but not as heavily as I did from 99 to around 2001 or two. Um, so let's just say that I'm getting old and I don't realize how much time has gone by. <laughs> but the, the, the reality is that the last decade from, from 2000 to 2010, you might say was kind of the decade of WSN, the wireless sensor network. And, uh, and I don't mean Wi-Fi necessarily. I just mean sensors being deployed that were not really IoT sensors. They were, they were not really in the mindset of this modern way of thinking about it, but they were proprietary in most cases. And the thing is, if you've got a manufacturing plant that has a few hundred of these sensors deployed, you expect those sensors to last a while, don't you? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you buy a clock and put it on the wall in your house and your your ch kids inherit it when you die, right? I mean, the thing just lasts forever. So these sensors are deployed in a lot of environments, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And the reality is it's working. And so as long as they keep working, they have no motivation to move to anything based on these standards, right? So I think that, you know, Zigbee came along in about the middle of that last decade. Of course, Wi-Fi was already there, but not a lot of the sensors were designed to use it. Bluetooth hadn't matured enough yet to really be used as much for it. And so we saw proprietary protocols. So now they're there, they're embedded in the manufacturing process. And so in industry, it's tough to go in and say, hey, we want to use standards based, so let's gut everything and put new stuff in. So I think that we're going to see slow moving toward it as other companies use it. But existing companies, if they've already got something proprietary in place that does the job for them and it's working fine, it's tough for them to justify the expenditure. So I think that uh, we'll see some movement toward more of the standards based stuff in industry. And we are seeing it actually. Um, but I think that some of those big, large scale wireless sensor networks that were installed back in the last decade are probably not going to be as motivated to move away very quickly. It could be 5, 10, even 15 years before we see a heavy move away from it, as long as they continue to do what they need them to do. So with that said, um, these are your big players. Uh, Bluetooth really with 4.2 is where we started to see some significant IoT capabilities added. Um, low energy was added. We've got link layer privacy since that time, uh, an IP support profile for IP communications, uh, Bluetooth smart things. All of this stuff started being incorporated around the version 4.2 of the Bluetooth specification. So we've certainly got enhancements there. And then there's power line communications, which is just uh, a term used to say that we're sending data across our power lines. Some of the technologies there include Prime, Home Plug, G3, PLC, GHNEM, uh, and IEEE 1901.2, which is actually kind of a combined standardized version of G3, PLC, and Prime. And so this is uh, beneficial when you have a device that you want to put into a place, plug it into power, 
and you get your communications back to your centralized systems across power line. So this is something that's being done. It's not, this is not something that, you know, we've only used in our homes with home plug. This is something that is used within business deployments as well. Of course, there are places where it doesn't work, right? Uh, you get into agro and you have large farm fields, things like that. And you want to do some type of sensor tracking or something. Obviously, you're not going to run a power line out there to do it. You're going to use battery operated wireless connected devices as your sensors, as your, your endpoint devices and so forth. So these are a few of the five layers that we do see being utilized within IoT. Now, let me cover a term for you that's really important to understand called the connected object or the CO. It's an object that may have originally been engineered without network connectivity with network integration. Once it's integrated to the network, has some intelligence, it's called an enriched CO. It's an object enhanced by the network connection. Um, so think about that coffee pot, right? If, if I have a coffee pot connected to the network, if the only thing that it's doing when it's connected to the network is uh, downloading firmware updates or something like that, uh, we wouldn't call that really a connected object or an ECO. Uh, instead, we would say that is just a device that can be updated across the network, right? It's enriched because the network connection provides some capability it wouldn't have otherwise. Like, for example, me being able to hit a button in an app on my phone and tell it to start brewing the coffee or it to detect where I'm at and start brewing the coffee accordingly uh, and so forth. There are three key elements of a connected object according to Challenges of the Internet of Things by Wiley in 2018. Data generation, transmission and or reception, data processing, and the ecosystem within which it exists. So the, the CO may generate data, may transmit data, may receive data. It needs to have algorithms for data processing. There might be some AI or machine learning or something like this involved in this process. It may be that it's entirely within the connected object. It may be that the connected object depends on a centralized system for computation and then gets results back from it. Um, there, this is where you get the interconnection with the ecosystem. So the network that it's a part of, the services, the applications, everything that's out there to make the connected object work. And we'll be coming back to connected objects as we go on. So where is IoT? Well, first of all, there's a general description here. So according to ITU 2005, uh, in chapter five of their Into 5, we see uh, it's all about three things. Any time connection, any place connection, any thing connection. So anything connected anywhere at any time, right? And so when it comes to any things, um, this could be PCs, laptops, mobile phones, and again, refrigerators, toasters, machinery, health monitoring systems, etc. Any place, well, wireless is what brings that there, right? So if it's PLC connected, it's not any place connected. It's got to be connected where there is a power line. Um, if it's wireless and it has the right wireless capabilities, cellular, for example, what have you, then it can be connected any place. And then any time means that there's no constraint of time windows when it can be connected or moving versus stationary, etc. right? So these are the driving things within IoT. Now, where is IoT in use? Well, this is roughly in order of most common use today based on many different research articles. So some disagree about what's used more based on the studies they're looking at. So I've put these in kind of a rough order of use. Smart home, wearables, within industry, healthcare, smart city, connected vehicles, smart retail, smart supply chain, and smart agro, uh, farming, etc. Now, the, the reason I say it, it's a rough order, it, different people define these things differently. So connected vehicles, some people define connected vehicles as when you get into the car, your phone connects to the car and that's a connected vehicle. Some people define connected vehicles as the vehicle connects to the internet or your home network or other networks and communicates. Well, if that's how you define a connected vehicle, there are far fewer of them. If you define it as your, you get into the vehicle with your phone and it connects automatically via Bluetooth to the car, there, there are far more of them. So this is where there's a lot of variety. How you define what this thing is, is going to determine how much it's being used. So if you define smart retail as you're using barcode scanners that connect via Wi-Fi to go out and do inventory, then there's a lot more of it than if you define smart retail is the customers walking through and their phone is automatically 
uh, sensed and connected to the store's network. And they're given information about sales and specials based on past purchasing decisions, et cetera, et cetera then obviously it's more limited. So it depends on how you define it. These things can be defined differently in different research studies. And so it gives us different results. But there, there's no question that the largest number of sales of IoT devices today, of what we generally call IoT, is consumer. So smart home and wearables. And then industry is using it. And then healthcare. Then you get this concept of smart city, which is one of the most vague concepts out there. I have read four books on smart city and IOT, and all four of them have a definition different enough that you could not say that they're defining the same thing. <laughs> and so uh, smart city can vary greatly depending on who defines it. But these are all areas where we see IOT being utilized today, and we're going to see it used more in the future for sure. So let's talk a little bit about architecture, the components, whether you call it IOT, IPOT, or network OT, the architecture is the same, right? So we've got the hardware. These are the end devices. Uh, think your machinery monitoring module that you place in the manufacturing environment, your uh, sugar level monitor for healthcare, anything like that. So end devices. Then there's the network where you've got the physical, the Mac, and the network layer. We're moving toward IP as the network layer instead of proprietary stuff. And we're moving toward standards for the physical and Mac layer instead of proprietary stuff. And then you've got the software. So this includes APIs. It might include, for example, RESTful APIs, proprietary custom build APIs. Uh, maybe you're doing cloud processing and you're using uh, the AWS API gateway or something of that sort. The point is we have these APIs. Then we have algorithms. Um, and artificial intelligence, machine learning, there can be a, a little difference between that. I mean, personally, yeah, I, I have literally read dozens of books over the last 10 years on artificial intelligence. Just finished reading another one recently. Uh, I have probably read 30 books on machine learning, deep learning, these kinds of things as well that are specifically on that subset of AI. And in the end, I come back to one simple thing. It, they're algorithms. It's what they are. are. Are they more advanced algorithms? Yes. Are they inter-networked algorithms where portions of the algorithm run on different systems? And then there's one master algorithm that takes the information together and comes up with some decisive result? Uh, yes, but they're still algorithms. It's all a computer knows how to do. And so uh, to me, you've got algorithms and within algorithms, you have, uh, for example, a sorting algorithm, right? Um, which someone could define as AI. And then you've got other algorithms and then you've got artificial intelligence algorithms. And then within artificial intelligence algorithms, you have machine learning, deep learning algorithms. So kind of just layers of algorithms, right? The general concept of algorithms, more specific subcategories of algorithms. But if you disagree with that, that's fine. You can, you can absolutely uh, have your own opinion on it. Uh, so I've put them here as separate bullet points in case you don't want to put AI and machine learning in the category of an algorithm. But the concept is that these algorithms or AI or machine learning are behind the APIs and allow for intelligent decisions to be made based on these IoT devices. Uh, in a manufacturing environment, to keep it nice and simple, it could be that we're adjusting the temperature within the work environment. Uh, in healthcare, it could be that we're notifying a medical provider based on some metrics that we've gathered in health monitoring. So again, these are the parts and pieces that come together to make what we think of today as IoT work. This is Cisco's IoT model. So to just make sure we get something a little more complicated in here. <laughs> um, so first of all, you have your end devices, right? The things in IoT, and they're connected in some way. So whatever that connection is. Then there's edge computing, um, which is where we might do some level of analysis, data transformation, things like that. We're aggregating all of this data together. This is data accumulation. Then we're abstracting the data. We're pulling it into its component parts that are needed for different analysis purposes. Then we have our applications that do the reporting, the analysis, the control. And then finally, we have collaboration processes. Now people are actually using all this stuff, right? So all the devices are connected to the network at the edge, we're deciding where what data needs to go. Then we're accumulating that data together into some central storage locations, might be big data, what have you. We're then abstracting that out for its individual purposes and then reporting, analysis, control, and finally people look at that to make decisions only humans can make, right? So that's the basic flow in the Cisco model for IoT. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about what things do, okay? So first of all, things can talk to things. So this would be a connected object to a connected object. So these two things are talking to each other. For example, you might have a, a temperature sensor that talks to the thermostat. Well, let me give you an example. Have you ever noticed that in homes, your thermostat's in one room and that room is nice and comfy and all the other rooms are too hot or too cold? So for example, in my house, we have upstairs, we have downstairs and we have a basement and upstairs gets too hot when downstairs is comfortable. Downstairs is too cold when upstairs is too hot. Of course, the thermostat is downstairs. Now, what if I had a temperature gauge upstairs that talked to the downstairs and then it was smart enough in my system for me to say between the hours of 10 o'clock at night and seven o'clock in the morning, I want the upstairs thermostat to control the actual furnace. And then during the day, I want the downstairs thermostat to control the furnace. Now, that's a simplified view of what we could do. We could get more complex, complex than that, but the connected object upstairs could talk to the connected object downstairs, which is actually the thing that drives the furnace, right? So that's an example of CO to CO. Now, it could just be CO to service. So this connected object talks to a service. It doesn't talk to other connected objects. And then who knows what happens from the service point on, right? Or it could be CO to service to CO. So now there's an intermediary between all of the connected objects instead of them talking directly with each other. And then there's CO to service to human. There's an intermediary between the humans and the connected object. Or it could be CO directly to human. Now you might wonder, what could that be? Well, this would be using methods that only humans could perceive. A uh, sight, well, okay, so there's vision processing and artificial intelligence, but let's keep it at the human level. So sight and sound, right? I guess you could do smell. You could have the connected object put off a particular odor to tell you something. Um, but uh, an example of that, by the way, could be an IoT smoke detector that when it detects excessive heat in an environment, it puts out an odor that smells like smoke. Now, I think that's silly, but I'm just saying you could do that if you wanted to. But sight and sound, right? So CO directly to human, think of the old teapot, right? What did it do when the water was hot? It put out a whistle. And so that was an unconnected object to human, right? So same thing, we could have the object put out a tone to let us know something. So we already have that, right? If we have a smoke detector, they put out a beeping sound, loud piercing tone to let humans know I've detected smoke. Well, that could be a connected object, uh, an IOT smoke detector, and it still does the same thing. That's still CO to human. It's intended for direct communication with a human. So you usually think some type of alarm or notifications either visually presented or audibly presented, okay? So CO to CO, CO to service, CO to service to CO, CO to service to human, CO to human. So these are some of the common interactions. And this is where we come back to all this cyber physical. So cyber devices existing in the physical world in some way. All right, so what are the top security concerns with IoT? Well, according to OWASP, uh, there are a number of them, and I've aggregated some of their uh, top 10, but uh, insecure web interfaces, first of all, so they're configured through a web interface and they're not secured, so anyone can get into them. Insufficient authentication and authorization. Insecure network services, so the services on the network that they talk to are not secured. Lack of transport encryption and therefore privacy concerns. This is an area where I've combined a couple of them. Uh, so they list separate transport encryption and privacy concerns. But if we have encryption, then that takes care of a lot of the privacy concerns. There are other privacy concerns as well. Uh, that is to say that the data that's being shared, even though it's encrypted in transport, might be, in my opinion, a breach of my privacy, right? Uh, insecure interfaces, both cloud and mobile. Uh, insufficient security configurability. So we simply lack the security options you need. An example might be, a Wi-Fi door lock, right? So Wi-Fi door locks could easily be placed in this category of IoT. The door lock tells some central system through a Wi-Fi connection that so-and-so has unlocked the door or the door has opened or the door has closed, etc. cetera. Uh, this is not uncommon for these devices to not support the newest 802.11 security solutions like WPA2 instead of WPA or even going forward WPA3. 
insecure software. So the software itself has security vulnerabilities. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And poor physical security. So the device itself could possibly be breached by someone having physical access to it. So these are all security concerns. What are our solutions? Well, we need secure booting. So this means that when the device boots up, it validates that the software it's about to run is the authorized software. Uh, access control, we need authentication authorization. Firewalls and IPS to give us network level security. And then encryption for privacy and patching because I'm gonna talk more about this in a moment, but we live in a real world. And so we have to make sure that we are patching our devices. So let me kind of summarize with some IoT challenges and questions. The first question is, do we need better quality encoding? Uh, so here's the, here's the dilemma that we face, right? In the past, humans made decisions. Doctors made decisions, nurses made decisions, emergency responders made decisions. What happens in a world where IoT devices make decisions? It's not so much we can't trust them, but you know, used to a programmer made a mistake in code and they said, well, that's just a bug, we'll fix it in the next version. Well, you know what, if a bug in an IoT device means that health monitoring is not working and the person that's trusting the health monitoring is trusting the health monitoring, then when they get symptoms that there's something wrong, they say, but I've got this monitoring device. It would be telling my doctor, my doctor would be contacting me if there was really something wrong. So um, I must be fine. It's all in my head. And they don't take action all because of a bug. So in that scenario, a bug is massively more important. And so improved quality encoding, I, I think, is a key thing. And rapid turnaround in patches and fixes and so forth are going to be very important. And I know over the years, you go back to the 80s and 90s, nothing was updated automatically. It was all very manual. And then we got uh, automatic updates and, and then things could be updated automatically. But then we had problems where an update was actually the problem. <laughs> So we all have the experience in the world of computers to say that maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't trust them. So there's going to be some educational things where people that are using health monitoring and things need to know you still are the best monitor of your own health. You are still the one that needs to say, I'm feeling this way, and so I should go to the hospital. Um, obviously, that's very, very important. And I think we do need to establish ways to have better and better quality encoding. The second question that always comes up, are we all going to lose our jobs? Well, some jobs are going to be lost. There's no question. Um, but let me rephrase that and say some job types are going to be lost. It doesn't mean a job has to be lost or employment or the ability to earn income has to be lost. But it is very important for people to know the right skills. And this is why I always emphasize with my kids that it's very, very important to understand programming and computing and things like that. Uh, with a world like this, jobs are going to be there. Look at the next one. Where do we go from here? 25 billion by 2020, 50 billion by 2025, 125 billion by 2030, some are estimating over 400 billion possibly by 2050. So uh, the point is those are all things that had to be programmed, things that have to function, that have to work. But the people that build them, the program them, that work with them are people that know programming, are people that know networking, are people that know these types of things. So will we all lose our jobs? Well, it depends on what your job is. You might lose your job, but you don't have to lose a job. Just like we've seen in the past, that as new things come along, jobs change, new opportunities arise, and so forth. Uh, for example, when we saw the Industrial Revolution 2.0 with electricity added, everybody said the same thing. You can see old news articles. Are people going to be unemployed in our factories now because of the assembly line? And the answer is we saw more office workers, right? So more people working in sales, more people working in management, more people working in administration and things like that, uh, which guess what? We're higher paying jobs. So actually jobs got better for people. And I'm just going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say it. I think the job market's going to be better for people going forward, not worse. And so I think it will, however, require the right skills. Well, with all of this IOT stuff going on, um, obviously we need some way to learn this stuff. So I've got good news for you. <laughs> Certified Wireless Solutions Administrator is going to cover IoT 
at a fair level of depth. Uh, if you put it into the concept of training, probably about a day's worth of training just on IoT itself, uh, because it's not just CWSA is not an IoT certification, but IoT is part of it. And so I think you'll see uh, close to around a day's worth of training related to IoT in that when everything is said and done. CWSA is going to be a CWNA level course, and so it'll be a four and a half to five day course depending on the training center and how they go about delivering it. Um, and so IoT is just going to be a part of that course. So you'll certainly want to watch for that going forward. Okay, so we've had our introduction to IoT, a little more than the 30 minutes that I try to aim at for these webinars, but that's okay. Um, as I said, in future webinars, we'll get into the more technical details of some of these protocols that are used. So we'll take a little more depth uh, of look at Zigbee, uh, at the newer Bluetooth that's out there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the higher layer protocols that are used in IoT for communications. So when we get to that world, you know, we're going to be looking at uh, various protocols like MQTT, LWM2M, OMADM, TR69, and, and others as well. So these are protocols that are about messaging, right? And there are just a few of them, and we'll talk about how they work and, and what they might do for us in IoT. With that said, this is the end of our scheduled content. So at this point, I'd like to thank you for attending the webinar.